again. Unbelievable. Her <laughs> YouTube. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, so. Okay, now, really sorry for you, but I have to repeat it. Um, <laughs> was just <laughs> not started. I had not started the streaming here on YouTube. I also always have to double check, check the buttons here. So thank you very much, all of the viewers uh, and attendees here for joining us for a new uh, live stream from Telescope Service, again under the full moon. So we are back in our regular uh, full moon session interval. But we uh, decided to, to uh, slow it a bit down. So we will do this live stream every eight weeks now, every second full moon. We are trying to do this. There are still um, yeah, six sessions per year. That would be, I think, it's uh, still uh, pretty okay. And yeah, now let's talk a bit about today's plan, today's program. We have another guest speaker here. We are super happy uh, to welcome Julian here on the on the stream. That we yeah we can uh, offer him a little presentation, and we are really curious to see uh, some of his images uh, that he can show us uh, in the next uh, I think one hour. And we will also show you some of the guest images. With guest images, I mean uh, from you, images from you, the viewers out there on the channel. Uh, we have got really nice uh, replies to, to, um, on the email with some really uh, great images. And I will show them within the session. And we four here have also something to show you. But as you may know, or you're also suffering the same problem that the weather just not permits very long deep integrations uh, over the last weeks. So I don't know if there's much to show you, but I think we will do our best. We will try our best. So and with, uh, without further ado, I would give the stage to Julian if he is ready. <laughs> Yeah, I'm ready. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, uh, out some logistics, but it's fine. Uh, just, just again, uh, thank you very much for for joining us here, and uh, we're super happy that you took the chance, and we can show something from you here. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess I can just start with an introduction of myself. Um, yeah, I'll just start that way. Um, my name is Julian. I'm 23 years old. I'm from Germany. And uh, yeah, astrophotography is my big passion. <laughs> um, let me think, when did I start? I think 2017, maybe 18? Probably 18. Um, I started out by scrolling through Instagram and just seeing some Milky Way images. And I always thought to myself that, A, this is either some Hubble kind of thing or like professionals. I never knew that you could literally take your phone in a dark place and then take a cool Milky Way image like that. And I don't know, I tried it and it hooked, it got me hooked from the, from the get go. And then it was just down the rabbit hole really. Um, and yeah, I, what was my first amount? It was a star adventure. And I quickly learned that light pollution is really bad because I tried to use it in in the midst of a city and i literally couldn't find polaris because it was so bright and um yeah that's how it started and i don't know over the years i just started getting more and more gear spending more and more money and um i hope that my images improved a bit <laughs> i like to think so and uh yeah that's basically how i ended up where i am right now okay So what was your favorite equipment that you had? So let's say that you started with the little star tracker and then maybe you went to Equatorial. What was, out of everything you've had, what was the favorite kit you had almost? Honestly, it would probably come down to either my old telescope, the Celestron Rasa 8, or the Star Adventure. Um, I had to sell the Star Adventure pretty early on because I was studying at that time and I really didn't have the money. And um, 
I, I really regretted that um, selling that because it's just such a just such an awesome little mount and it's so easy to use and I'm definitely planning on buying one next year sometime and getting back into some wider wider field stuff but it's gonna be either that or or the raw side which is just amazing yeah. yep I can show you I can try to show you guys an image show us, uh, if, if you have like an evolution of your images from you know you said the first military shots you mm. took to like the uh, Rasa images that used to that would be great just to see how that evolved. Yeah, let me just try to open up my Instagram real quick. That's probably the easiast way to do that. Either that or Astrobin, whatever is easier for you. Whatever I don't you have, have that many images on Astrobin, that's why. Not an ad for Astrobin then, don't. <laughs> Take it as an ad I, I have like six or seven images on there, but it's, it's really not a lot. Um, yeah, that was my, okay. Let me share the screen. I hope that my screen won't go crazy. I used to have issues. Okay, I think it's fine. Last time I shared my screen through yeah. Zoom, my entire laptop just uninstalled the graphics drivers. It was awful. But um, yeah, back then I used to, this was, yeah, this was 2018. And that image right here is basically the first deep sky image ever. Okay. Um, is with the, the first taste of the drug, is that's what it is. This is the first taste of the drug. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and and I was either. so blown first away. Shot. Yeah, that was with my um, 300 millimeter lens. It was a Sigma uh, 300 f4, and my Nikon D3300, which I've used for a long time after that, which is a great camera, and the Saw Adventure. Um, I don't remember the the exposure time or anything. It's probably an hour or something like that. But that image really got me hooked. Like just the 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 hint of the horse head right there and the flame nebula just that really got me hooked. And then obviously Orion next. I mean everyone does Orion when they're starting out. I remember taking that image. I was that was the first experience um, where I really um, that really hurt because I didn't have a car back then. So essentially I took a bus with like 10 kilograms of gear, <laughs> went out through the middle of nowhere and was stuck there for four hours or five hours until the, until the first bus came at like 4 a.m. <laughs> that was so cold. And it well, was that's like commitment right there. I think that's Julian, that's a lot of commitment. Yeah, right. yeah I, th I think we all experience something like that every now and then. <laughs> um, yeah, and then it just, thought there was some wide field images. That was one of my coolest images back then. Still the same gear, um, still the Star Adventure. And yeah, that was eight hours. I'm surprised it's that much. And from that on, I think all of these images had the same gear. It was just, that's M33. But all of these images were really low exposure time. Well, now that I look at it, it doesn't look that great. <laughs> And we're assuming you were processing in Photoshop at this point, right? At that point, it was entirely in Photoshop, yeah. Stacking in Deep Sky Stacker and all of the processing in Photoshop, yeah. I, I didn't switch to PixInsight until this year. I, I, I got in really late. Um, I don't even know why. I, I mostly thought that my laptop couldn't handle it, which was wrong. What did you use here? What lens is this? This is a 15 millimeter? Or? Um, that or one was a... I think a 50, yeah. Probably a 50, yeah. But that lens wasn't great for Astro. It, it couldn't keep the focus across the entire frame. And you can see there's a lot of noise in there. I'm not even sure how much of that is actually true nebulosity. <laughs> um, probably all the Barna, the HA uh, filament is there, but it, it's also that they're not corrected for, 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 for imaging in space and the pinpoint stars become commas or whatever. Yeah, so. definitely. There was a lot of things that was wrong in that image, but, but yeah, I don't know. And I think it started going uphill when I got my, my Explore Scientific IXOS 100 mount because that enabled me to actually go longer than 60 seconds. And I think that was around the time when I got that. Oop, you also did pretty nice landscape photography as well. I, have to say. I did yeah. some, yeah. I also want to get back into it, especially some wide angle Milky Way shots, but um, I kind of got sucked into the, the whole Astro thing and it just completely took over. 
Like it does, yeah. Uh, Julian, yeah. just a little interruption uh, in the chat. It was a question or is a question. How, chat, how did you learn to process like that? I'm following you for quite a while on Instagram and YouTube. Your images are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, honestly, it's just a lot of practice and not just that, but also I feel like whenever I process an image, I learn something new about it. Oftentimes you, you don't know exactly what to do or you feel like it looks bad and then you just scroll through forums like Cloudy Nights or ask friends like, how would you do that? And um, there's always more to be learned. Yeah. And I think the worst thing you can do when, when it comes to processing images is having a, a set workflow. Like I'm an advocate for having a workflow, but that's basically just covering the basics, the essential things that has that have to be done. But beyond that, you should always try to aim at trying out new things and um, trying out different processes and different programs, maybe even to, to get to where you want to be. But um, I think so most is, of good it's images. It's trial and error here, isn't it, Julian? It's trial and error and trying yeah, to improve it. I have, I have spent so much time in Photoshop and Pixinsight. It's, it's not even funny. <laughs> like for some images, I've literally spent 10 or 20 hours capturing the data and then another 20 hours yeah. processing it over and over again. I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, it's That's... very time consuming. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was all with the old setup. And I think, yeah, I think that was the first, um, that was the one of the first images with my refractor. It was an Orion ED80. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome little scope, and um, yeah, that definitely was was a big improvement from the Sigma lens. Um, I, I love that scope. As a beginner scope, I, I think I paid two hundred and fifty euros for it, and it's it's really it's really good value for when you're starting out and you're not sure how much you should spend or what type of scope is right for you these these small refractors are amazing yeah it looks like you're also getting into more of a guiding and other things because you can see a little bit of drift yeah uh, definitely but yeah. i think that's it's negligible uh julian yeah. but what was the mount for for these images with this orion telescope it has to have been the explore scientific ixos 100 Mm -hmm. um, okay. I had that for around a year and I really liked it, but I knew that I was going to migrate from the ED80 at some point. So that's why I didn't keep it longer. I immediately moved to an EQ6 when I got the chance. Yeah, sure. And that's what I've been using ever since. I'm not sure when exactly the switch happened. But you can start seeing the results because you yeah. can start seeing better yeah, tracks and you can start seeing closer. Yeah. That's so fantastic uh, timeline improvement here to see. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it's it's basically with all things in life. The more you, you do it, the better you get at it. I, I don't think I've ever seen someone who continuously had no progress over an, over a year. So it's just natural that you improve. Um, but I, I can also understand that at first, when you start in this hobby, that it might seem, um, what's the word for it? A bit discouraging when you have when you have images from these real pros who have amazing data, and then you take your crappy lens and you get awful coma, and you just I know that it can feel really bad, but yeah, you just have to keep in mind that eventually you're going to get there as well. I, I think on this point there are two ways. Uh, the one way is you overcome the problems and you just keep going and keep learning new things and trying out new things. Or you just sell everything and do something else, something other. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. You have to go oh, into astrology, right? I heard that, that <laughs> yeah, well. exactly. It's, <laughs> it's close to our hobby. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is a hobby that, that it requires a lot of endurance and perseverance. Yeah. Um, if you're someone who easily gives up, it, it's probably not the right one. Um, but it's also I one think of the money helps I, as well, Julian. Yeah, it definitely does. <laughs> but it's also, in my eyes, it's also one of the most rewarding ones because it, like, whenever you show your images to someone who has no idea what astrophotography actually is, and like they can't even understand how the, how space can look like this, and the feeling that you capture stuff like this, who most people would simply think, oh, that's Hubble, right? 
Mm. I think that's a great feeling, and that's part of the reason why we do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that was my first image where I actually used an H alpha. Yeah, that was the first H alpha RGB image. That that really blew my mind. That's a that's a pretty dim object right there, uh, Heart Nebula. It's, yep. uh, yeah. Ah, I also featured telescope service here. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. That that was the first image where I used my 0.8 reducer with the ED80, and the I think it's a 40% increase in in light gathered, and that is it makes such a difference. Mm. Yeah. Yep. And it's only 30 minutes of HL. That's actually crazy. Yeah, that was a second. Th that's when I really got into narrowband imaging. This one as well. Yeah. It's, a bit, it's a bit oversaturated, but <laughs> yeah, I think that was, I think that was actually RGB data that I really messed up. But it somehow turned out to, to look that way. Yeah, that's interesting. It kind of looks like you messed up the the Bayer pattern in the stacking. I think it was a lot of selective color adjustments in in Photoshop. Like I wanted it, the colors to shift, and I also inverted the the blue to to red. I swapped the channels. I think, yeah. but um, it's a bit artistic. But <laughs> I really loved the narrowband look back then. Oh, well, that was Atlas, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so this was this was last year, almost a year ago, right? That was, you were taking these. Uh, yeah. yeah. April. April 2020, roughly a year yeah. ago. Yeah, I think those were the last images I had with my refractor. That one was with uh, I took that with a scope in our observatory in in my city in Freiburg. We have a pretty large observatory, um, and that was with a 15 inch Newtonian. That image was really sharp. And I think that's also where I started to join the aperture fever through. <laughs> where I really wanted a big scope. <laughs> that comes with another with a lot of problems, but if you do oh, make yeah. it, it's stunning. Yeah. That's also around the time where I upgraded my mount, I think. Um, now it's stuck. One second. Oh, my mouse is not working again. Here we go. Yep. That works. Yeah, that that has to have been an image I took with the with the new mount. But the galaxy has been awful for me. I just can't seem to properly get a good image of it. I don't know why. It's rough. That's my cat. <laughs> galaxy Crazy. Eyes. So you upgraded the cat eyes to a telescope to see M eighty one M eighty two like that. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? I was just saying you upgraded the cat size to see M82 up close. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I like doing weird things with him. It's pretty funny. Oh yeah, I, I did do some moonshots every now and then. Yeah, that's a weird image. Don't know about that one. That's that? Venus. That was, that's Venus. That's a really weird image. Uh, but, I took that through a C14, but I had uh, no clue about planetary imaging. I literally wrote it here. I am clueless, but it, um, I don't know. It that, looked fun. Is that Venus though? Blue? Yeah, it's Venus. Okay. But um, I don't even know what camera. I think I even used my, my Nikon camera. So less yeah. than ideal, but still a fun experiment. Yeah, that's another reprocess. It's a full moon. That's another yeah. image with the 15 inch Newtonian. Yeah. That that scope is amazing. And it's also, uh, the camera I used was still my Nikon D3300, which I'm, I'm so blown away at the, how, how clean this sensor is. I think it's a similar sensor to the um, QHY286. So even though it's uncool, it's pretty good. Let me see. That's just a reprocess. That's ugly. You got yep. a little bit of I IFN as well, interflux and velocity there. Yep. The dust. yep. That's that's the image that made me decide I want a Rasa. Because I I just love this IFN. And 
like just when I think about having a Rasa when when this occurred, when um when Pan Stars the comet flew past, mm. it's amazing. That really got me hooked. And I mean that was May last year. Okay, I didn't buy the Rasa until the beginning of this year actually. Up, oh, that's some more bicolor narrowband. And this is all with the DSLR still. Summer moon. Okay, let me just skip forward a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that was my last Andromeda image I, I've taken. I haven't had the chance to take one this year. But it's just such a cool galaxy. And I also love seeing so many different interpretations of it online. Like, there are so many different versions of the same galaxy, but they all look so different. Uh, I think cool. when, when people put a lot of HL finders, it does look like a different cool object. Uh, yeah. I think it Yeah, is. definitely. Can you go back to the Andromeda galaxy, please? Yep. Uh, question. Is there the noise in the background or is the integrated flux nebula? Because I know that around Andromeda and the M33, there's a field of integrated flux nebula, especially around the star Mira. Which is right in between. Yeah, now um, that has to be noise. Oh, okay. That that but was. It would, it would be cool if you shoot it with a Ross or something some someday. I yeah. would. <laughs> uh, I'm definitely planning on shooting it sometime, but that that has to be noise. The image was not that deep. Like the halo of the galaxy does show up nicely, but that stuff right there that that can't be IFN. It's that would be too faint. Mm. Yeah. That was probably my second favorite image with the Nikon. I didn't actually believe that you could do really nice narrowband images that look like monochrome images until I used that. And that what, was also, what I think... Using? What filters were you using for this? I used the... I think that was the first image where I used the um, L-Extreme filter, the Optolong L-Extreme. That was really cool. I also have a YouTube tutorial on how to do that if anyone's interested. Um, what um, was what was the integration time of of these kind of images? I believe it's uh, super super deep or long. I think mostly around ten hours. That's okay, that's the probably yeah, yeah. the the average back then. Okay, I I started to go deeper when I got the Rasa, but back then, yeah, eight to ten hours. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, can, more. can you just show me the the bubble? That mm -hmm. maybe also a bigger telescope, or yep, that was the the fifteen inch Newtonian once again. Ah, okay, that was a, a lot of stuff went wrong with that image. Okay, but it still showed up nicely in the end. Yeah, the bubble is a dim object. I've shot it as well with my Richie. And yeah, it is. You need a lot of integration time and a good amount of data. I think this was uh, thirty minutes of data. Yeah. No, I think it's more than No, uh, that's definitely more. Yeah, 30 minutes? Oh. Yeah, I, I don't think it's much more. Okay. Um, is this with the Newtonian or what's called the Newtonian, right? Yeah, with the Newtonian. It's a it's a 15-inch F5. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, here it is. It's it's an hour's worth of noisy, cloudy, <laughs> starsky, <laughs> starstreaky crap. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that the 15-inch one, it, it really sucks in light. It's It's crazy. <laughs> Oh yeah, that was my favorite image I ever took with the Nikon. I can wait. I can open that up in big. This is the Nikon and the Newtonian again, right? Yep, and that's just that completely blew my mind. That image. You can see the the trapezium pretty well, actually, which is yep. I did use some much. shorter exposures for the trapezium. So this was heavy processing. Definitely, yeah. Of, yeah. That was just so cool. <laughs> And that's I think that's three hours of integration time and, and there's basically no noise in this image. Yeah. That's the cool part about these super bright nebulae. That's right, yeah. Yeah. No, that's also my wallpaper. I I just can't get around that image. It's so awesome. Oh my mouse is stuck again. Right. Um but yeah, that was that was the first image I took. We we recently got, I think at the end of last year, we got a new scope in our observatory. And that was in a six inch APO triplet from APM. 
And that scope is incredible. Mm -hmm. That was also the first image with my QHY 183M. That was, I, I just love the IFN. Yeah. Uh, that was also my first image that really had a long integration time at 30 hours. Um, but yeah. Is well, Bordeaux uh, Sky is the, is the observatory in? Because to get the IFN, you can't get it in the city or Bordeaux floor. It has to be pretty dark. Yeah, it's, I think it's pretty hard to tell because essentially it's, it's, it's situated on or located on the top of a mountain. And on the left side, we have my hometown, my city. And on the right side, there is basically nothing. So okay. if you photograph towards, uh, I think, east, I think east, um, it's probably Bordel four, maybe even three and a half. And on the left side, it's six, seven. So um, it really depends on where, where the sky, the target is located. But I think Bordel five I, is the, the average. And IFN, I, I, IFN in Bordel five, I would, it would take hundreds of hours or dozens of hours to see it. I've tried, so. Uh, yeah. Nice part. <laughs> so we are talking about the Black Forest, uh, aren't we? Yep. So yeah, this is also, I think there's some part at Dark Sky Reserve or something. So in this direction, it should be really dark, yeah. Yeah. I think the the uh, M81 is usually located around the zenith. At least when I when I photographed it in November last year. Yeah. So that was it. It was good. It was a nice, uh, nice and dark sky. It wasn't amazing, but it was nice and dark. Mm. Um, uh, Julian, let yep. me please interrupt you. Um, so <laughs> we can we can keep up the the rest of the photos for for uh, yeah just uh, in a couple of minutes, and then we can also talk a bit more about your future and what your plans are. But um, now I would give the word in our round here, because we are pretty, uh, some of you guys are short in time. So I would give the word to you uh, that you can uh, show us something that you may have captured over the last weeks now. And then, yeah, we can back Peter, to you. Peter, do you want to go first? Uh, sorry, can you repeat please? Uh, Peter, do you want to go first? Yeah, because Peter uh, and I, I think are, are stuck on time. So, okay. Uh, I'm yeah. Right yeah so you know i was really worried a few weeks ago i was really worried i wouldn't have anything to, to show um this time around but um the weather's just been so dreadful you know it's winter here in cape town and it's been bucketing down with rain but anyway i did get it in the end i got some uh, some clear nights and managed to finish a few uh, projects let me just share the screen quickly um sure uh, let's see Okay, you should be you should be able to see a gallery. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so so um, so this this little galaxy here this this is um, NGC six seven four four. Um, it's taking a long time. I started this project back in May, um, and uh, in the end, I managed to gather. Uh, just under 19 hours um, of integration time uh, with the um, with the Edge HD um, 800, um, and um, it's a beautiful galaxy. And it's got you know a little um, a little um, uh, if you like a sort of large Magellanic cloud sitting out here, um, um, and um, I've managed to pick out this this long very faint um, spiral arm, which is in fact in interacting with, uh, with this uh, satellite galaxy. Um, I didn't have time in the end to, to get some HA. Um, that'll have to wait until next year. But um, you know, with HA, you, you, know, you would really then pick up these, these ni nice sort of HA regions as well, which, are, which you can't pick out. Maybe a little bit of red here and there, you can pick out, there's, there's one over here. Um, but um, with HA, I think this would then nicely finish off uh, off this image. So I was very Peter, happy. This is your SCT, right? This is my SCT, yeah, yeah. So it worked out pretty well. I, I did attempt it last year, and I really wasn't very happy with with what I got last year. So this time around, I've I've got a a reasonably decent image, and and I'll build on it uh, 
uh, next year. I'll add the HA and maybe a bit more um, color data. Um, so it's about 10, uh, 10 hours of, of luminance uh, data and about nine hours of color data in this image. This is from Bortle, uh, Bortle 8 sky. So all my images are captured Bortle 8, Bortle 7, Bortle 8. So um, got to work pretty hard uh, to to get those photos. I, I still can't believe this. When you you re, you said this uh, already that you live in Bottle Eight, but I just can't believe it when seeing your photos. That's so crazy. Yeah, that's a really lovely shot. <laughs> and then I went back and and reprocessed. Um, I actually learned, you know, with it, with this image, I learned uh, a lot. Um, about processing LRGB data, you know, galaxy data. I haven't shot that many galaxies, but this was a great experience for me, both in terms of capturing the data and also processing. So mm -hmm. when I, I went back then to uh, to this uh, galaxy. This is NGC um, 4945, um, and I, I did a reprocess of, of that galaxy and, and using the same methods that I um, I used for. Um, uh, for for the spiral, um, and um, um, got a better result. Uh, the colors came up better in, in this version. Um, and then uh, the the ninety four millimeter the EDPH that's that also got some action um, this uh, this past a few weeks. Um, so I was able to finish off um, an SHO image of um, uh, the uh, Statue of Liberty. Um, nebula. Um, so that's NGC 3576. Um, and, and then I put in 20 hours. So th this was about 10 hours of no, about 15 hours of data. So five hours per channel. And then I put in 20 hours on the fighting dragons of, of Ara. Um, and I was pretty happy with the results that I, that I got. So I've got an, 10 hours more to process. Um, we've got the sulfur data as well to put in into this. So that's hopefully going to come out in the next few days. Um, so, so this, so this is 10 hours HA and 10 hours of O3. Um, you had a pretty, happy. I really love this one. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Especially the small little planet tree on yeah. the right side. That is so awesome. Yeah. You even got like there's a almost like a wave coming out of it. I guess yeah, it's O three, right? Shock it's so wave. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's some some O three has been blown off this uh, this nebula. Yeah, like a shell. Yeah. Um, and then I did uh, a kind of fake, you know, using the O three and the HA. I did a kind of fake uh, Hubble palette with uh, with with that data. Uh, so it's not the real deal, but it's um, just with um, O3 and HA. But um, that's a that's a common uh, common way to process this, uh, isn't it? This HOO uh, pellet. Yeah, yeah, H H O. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you synthetically generate the sulfur by using the hydrogen. So. Yeah. And then. Um, uh, just recently, I finished off um, the the running chicken nebula. So this is with the, the 61 EDPH. So this the, the little brother of the 94. Um, very happy with. I think it's, this is my best version of of that uh, nebula. Um, and uh, so that's uh, again about 20 hours of of, uh, of data went into into that project. P Peter, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure you mentioned it before. But what camera do you use for it? So this uh, this is with the uh, the 1600. So all these images are oh yeah, 1600. ASI ZWO ASI 1600. Yeah. yeah, and then you use the 294 and the SCT, right? And the 294 and the SEC, exactly. Yeah. So, so the galaxies were using the 294MN and uh, the, um, the nebulae with uh, the 1600MN. Um, so very happy with that. And there are some, some beautiful little Bok globule, globules mm -hmm. in, uh, in this nebula. So I did a sort of crop over here so you can see them coming out quite nicely here. 
I would like to see the bulk law build that's in the Tarantula Nebula that looks like a finger. If you get a bigger yeah. scope, uh, Peter, I would really like to see that one. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to get I'll have to get a bigger scope on loan from TS. I think that's uh, <laughs> and a bigger mount to carry it as well. Um, <laughs> I think you um, you should then, use some RC. <laughs> so then uh, I've been using the SCT for a long time. You know, for four or five months now, you know, on, 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 on galaxies, we actually went back to M83 and reprocessed that galaxy as well. This was with a one shot color. This was with the, um, the 294 MC. So what I did here was I extracted the luminance and, um, did a lot of sharpening on the luminance and then put the luminance back, um, into the, into the color image. So that worked hey, Peter, out. We Sorry to interrupt you, we have a question on the chat. What filters do you use on, on your cameras, both the 1600 Sorry? and 294? What filters do you use? Filters. A brand. Uh, so on the galaxies, uh, for, the, for, for the luminance, it's the, the Alpro. And for the color, it's, um, it's the, uh, the beta um, RGB filters. And for the narrow band, what do you, what, is it bad as well? And for the Nebulae, it's the beta. Yeah, it's, it's about a, um, um, a narrowband filters, exactly. Uh, so I'm quite excited about the new range of BADA filters that are about to be released. Um, so I'm quite excited to use those, hopefully in the coming weeks. So as I said, I was us using the, um, the Edge quite a lot uh, over the last few months. So I went back now, next few months, I'm going to go back to the RASA. So what I did is I, I did some modifications to to the scope. Uh, I was never never really happy with the with the diffraction spike. So I've got this this cable router now set up, and it makes a huge difference. Um, it, it almost completely removes the the diffraction spikes uh, from the from the bright stars. Very very happy with that. Um, you, you didn't want the diffraction spikes. Is that what it was? You didn't like the diffraction spikes at all. You don't get them at all now. Yeah. It's uh, really quite remarkable uh, what it does. Um, and the other, the other issue I had last year was I, you know, centering the camera um, is often quite tricky with with with, with the Rasta with the old um, uh, centering um, uh, retaining ring. The, the retaining ring, there's a bit of slop in that retaining ring, and I always battled getting the camera perfectly centered. So I often got a bit of tilt, at least in one corner. So I wrote to Celestron and they sent me a, a new retaining ring. So the newer, newer scopes now, which they ship, have a self-centering retaining ring. Um, and uh, this works a charm. You know, it's completely eliminated all my tilt issues as well. So I've basically got, got myself a new telescope. So I'm really happy with, uh, with this uh, setup. Um, and I've started using it in the last few days to gather data. So these are single um 122nd ha subs for the eagle and the the, the cat's paw nebula it really is an amazing telescope um it, it's fantastic uh, so I'm, I'm quite excited um about using this telescope again over the next uh, over the next few months um so yeah so that's uh, so that's me perfect thank you very much um then yeah we are really looking forward to to the next ones, that's so cool. Um, I would give the word to, to the next one in the round. Jasa, Jasa, would you be so kind? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm gonna share just two images um, that I, I was on vacation for the past three weeks, um, which was like on board of two to three. Um, so I managed to get like two pretty good images from there. Um, because, so yeah, if I'll share everything, um, computer has to stop sharing first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Excuse me. Okay. I'll just stop that. Okay. Let's see. Um, I'm going to share this. Yeah. That's working. There we go. I have just two images, um, and they both, both of them are wide field. Uh, so the first one is the Cassiopeia uh, arm, so the galaxy part and the Andromeda galaxy here. 
Um, that's just about two hours of exposure time, um, which I'm pretty, I'm not pretty happy with it, but the ending result um, came out quite nicely. Um, I had some problems that you can still see a tiny bit. There's like a red halo in the middle. I don't know the reason of it uh, because it never occur occurred before. Um, but I kind of managed it um, to get rid of it with selective masking in Photoshop. Um, but yeah, this is the one image. And then the second one is around 12 hours of exposure, um, showing quite a few of integrated flux nebula. Um, so this is the region between the Polaris. This, this star here is Polaris. And then the whole Cepheus um, constellation, you can see some Aris nebula here, and then this, the Dark Shark nebula, the Cave nebula here, and this is here. And then you can also see, just a second, uh, here's the Seahorse nebula, and then right here, somewhere here, is the Squid nebula, I think. The, the one that has like a um, blue squid inside of it. Um, so yeah, pretty dusty region. Beautiful I, shot. Though. Yeah, I don't think I I could be I, I would be able to image something like this from my city because the light pollution. Um, so I got a chance there, and I think I did quite a good job on it. Now, what were you shooting with? Maybe I missed it. I'm sorry. Uh, what, what did you shoot this with, uh, Yasha? With, with what equipment? Yeah. Uh, this was with the uh, Skywatchers EQ6R and the uh, Nikon D500 and no, 5030 and the Sigma 35 lens. Okay. Um, and I was a, I was a bit over mounting, but um, I didn't have a star venture yet. So this was the only option I could choose to image at all. I think you did an amazing job with the equipment you had. So besides the processing, I think the fact that you got it working is uh, a lot of great work to you, Yasha. Nice work. Thank you. So this is um, all from me. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so to, uh, to ensure that I'm not talking all the time, I would now show something from me, then Iron is on the list and then I can show the guest images. So um, just a moment, I also have to show something. To be honest, only two images from me. Just a moment. I also hope that your observatory wasn't hit by the rain and the kind of problems that hit uh, Thank you. that part of the world. Right. It was no problem in my location, but uh, literally 20 kilometers away, there were there were floods, there were um, houses damaged, streets damaged, really, really crazy time last week, over the last two weeks. And in Western Germany, the people were hit really, really hard. Many people died there. So um, unbelievable, really unbelievable. Yeah. So uh, for me, I was able only to capture Oops, it's now here. Um, I also brought my, my star adventurer out in the field and put a EOS 1200D, some sort of EOS Rebel, um, which is modified on it with a wide angle lens, 18 millimeter, and captured just the signals region. Um, this was, unfortunately, this was the only one I got. I also had a telescope with me, but nothing went went proper there, but I just love the signals region is always worth a shot. And this was exposed 20 times 120 seconds. So yeah, 40 minutes, not, not too much, but a nice one, I think. And the second one is a bit more uh, special to me because this was a first light. I, mm. I decided to, um, to invest in a ZWO ASI 2400, a full frame camera, which is now uh, connected to the RC at two meter focal length. 
and it's working yeah like a charm <laughs> it is uh, an OSC camera so uh, it's a bit limited in, in uh, possibilities because I don't use um, multi narrowband filters I, with this setup I just do RGB images but I like it so much the the stars are good I use a, a 0.8 uh, reducer from TS, 3 inch reducer, so it can illuminate the whole field properly. Uh, yeah, and this is the Wizard Nebula, by the way, uh, yeah. exposed uh, 25 times 5 minutes, so pretty long for my for my normal uh, uh, sessions. And this was also the only night I think over whole June and July. Uh, so it's everything I got. So uh, just a quick question on the 2400. It's it's part of the new series of cameras with the 571 and 455 chips, right? It's one of the uh, ones that doesn't have a lot of AMCLO and right. it's one of those newer chips, right? That's right. They have the zero AMCLO circuit. I still do darks, uh, of course, because I'm used to, to do darks, but it's really flat. I uh, had also did my, my dark lab library before and there was just no difference. 30 seconds, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, no difference. Uh, so super flat and easy easy to calibrate. That's super, super nice. They are also uh, given a 80% QE, I think. Don't know. Well, it's, it's a number. Uh, it's working good. And uh, I, the reason for me to, bore, to, to buy this camera was, of course, the big pixels. They are near six micron pixels, and that's what I need for for the RC. Otherwise, I would definitely have bought a cheaper camera. But anyway, that's that's working really nice, and it's also working for any other telescopes I have at home, except maybe the this uh, 74 EDPH. Then I would sample at three arc seconds per pixel. That would be pretty weird, but still working. So. I Deconvolution would probably deal with yeah. that, but this is a beautiful image, Thurston. And yeah. yeah, I think these newer cameras make calibration something that you almost don't need to do. Yeah, are you, it's, are you calibrating your flats at all? Are you cal calibrating them with with bias frames or with with uh, flat dots for this camera? Um, currently, to be honest, I did no flat calibration because I just wasn't able to capture flats. So this is, image is not flat processed. Uh, when I would do it, I would take flat darks because of uh, bad experience with the 294 MC. There, yeah. With the 294, I was not able to, to do it with bias frames because the, the uh, how to say, it, the responsiveness of the sensor is different with, with the zero exposure times, at least from my experience. So I yeah. always went mm -hmm. to try to do flat darks with to three second exposure, then I'm on the safe side. Yeah, cool. Okay. So, okay, that's from me so far. I won. It's up to you. Yeah, Tell I wanna I wanna start with a little story. Because, um, <laughs> yeah. So I think everybody here knows uh, the, the story itself. But uh, so 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 what happened was uh, before I share my screen, I had my eye on a telescope that uh, Telescope Express had on there. Uh, for a long time. It was a professional Ricci Cretian built by the people at Officina Stellare. So in ranks with the plane waves, the AG opticals, you know, a professional world grade scope, world class. But the problem was that it wasn't working. It had severe astigmatism. Um, itself is a special telescope because it's not collimatable by normal means. Let's just say you got to be really creative. So. I took a risk and thank you to TS Optics for helping me get it. I, I got it, I think it was late June. And then I went on holiday because I had to go. So I actually left it with a friend of mine who is a mad genius, I'll have to say. I don't think I've seen anybody who can do the things he does with telescopes. And honestly, I didn't have a lot of hope for it. Um, I tried to look at it myself. Um, it has some design issues that make it almost impossible to collimate with normal means. Actually, it is impossible. So 
I left it with him on a flame idea that he would get challenged and he would do it. So my friend Jim took it as a challenge and within a week and a half, the telescope was actually working. Now it's not perfect. It is still got some astigmatism due to spacing between the two mirrors, but I can work with that. The contrast and the sharpness out kind of maneuver any telescope I've seen so far. So let me actually share the, a few images of that telescope. And again, thank you to Torsten. I think Torsten, uh, can you guys see my screen and the images or just the finder? What do you see? Uh, no, we see, see the images. Yet yeah, now we see the, no, what's now? No, okay. <laughs> Give me a sec, give me a sec, I need to share this thing. Uh, yeah, so here we go. You guys can see my screen right there, right? Yeah, we yeah. see your finder, and now we see the image, yeah. So this is the telescope itself, Uchina Stellari Ultra uh, corrected Ricci Cretian 320. 320 refers to the size of the primary mirror, which is around 12.2 inches. It is a very fast scope, it's a f5.4. So it is faster than the GSO I had with the reducer, with the 0.75 reducer. It's, uh, it's a very heavy scope for the size of it. It's a lot smaller than the GSO, but it is 25 kilos, so pretty heavy. I think it's about 80 pounds with everything on it. Um, it has, um, this is the biggest design flaw, so it does not have a, centered, a center mark for the secondary. So it uses hyperbolic mirrors. And if you cannot align the primary and secondary, it's a very big paperweight because then the correction will not apply. The stars will not be properly, um, and the, the flat field will not exist. So this is how I could not actually collimate the telescope. The telescope had some damage to it, uh, made some small dings. The spider veins were kind of in bad shape. This is the actual corrector. So it comes with a built-in corrector that creates a 60 millimeter imaging field that's fully flattened with four micron stars, which for a Ricci Cretan telescope is very rare. Usually the stars are pretty big in those. So um, yeah, this is what it looked like initially. So you can see that it's pointing down. So there was a lot of work to be done on it. Um, it was taken apart, the secondary was taken off. These are the ball bearings that control the actual movement of the secondary mirror. And you can see a lot of tools here because there's a lot of stuff happening with it. Um, it was repainted. A lot of the pieces, were, this is actually the back and these are the collimation screws. Um, and this is again, the secondary put in place, the baffles repainted so that no reflections come off it. This is when it was close. Uh, this is actually the front. If you were to pay a lot more money you would get a focuser for the secondary, which will move the secondary slice to focus it. This is common on professional RCs like uh, RCO, RCOs and others. Again, it is a very, very beautiful scope. It's just that it had some issues. I got the, luckily it has the same focuser flange as the GSO, so I got my Sato in there. Um, you can say a lot about Filippo, but his products are beautiful and they work amazingly. So I think that I am still impressed with the Sato focuser. It is small, it is affordable, but works extremely well whenever I want to autofocus. Yeah, and after a lot of um, hard work, uh, this is my first image with it. I was stunned by the level of detail, I was stunned by the level of contrast. Um, this was around 12, I think it was 12 hours or 15 hours of HA and about five hours of oxygen. This is using the Officina Stellari Telescope, QHY600M bin 2x2, two two because with this telescope, it has such a small star size that even if you're guiding at 0.9 R seconds and your resolution is 0.8, you will see the distorted stars. It's such a sensitive um, piece of equipment that I still need to calibrate my, my, my mount to be perfectly guiding for this. Um, this is using chroma 3 nanometer oxygen and chroma 8 nanometer HA. Um, I worked, I processed this image over six or seven times at least because I could never get what Julian had in his image, which I really like Julian, by the way, is this wispy kind of F2 um, HA um, nebulosity. And I think I, I decided that this was enough. Um, it, it, it is something that, again, the detail and the contrast were to me something that really stunned 
uh, stunned my eye, and it was it was I'm really happy that you know I could get this telescope from TS Optics. So again, a good a nice thank you to them. And it's a real great image, honestly. Um, um, oh, by the way, what camera is this? Uh, QHY 600M, so it's an IMX 455 chip. Um, actually, to go to that, Peter, you don't need to use bias frames for these newer chips. They're actually detrimental to the calibration. So yeah. if, you, if you get a 2600, 6200, or 2400, never use biases. Uh, these camera, cameras are really unpredictable. So even darks over time, they change because the chips are very sensitive and the actual noise level changes. So what the best advice I can give is just make sure you calibrate with flats at the, at the actual uh, mean value that your image is at. So for example, my average is a thousand, that's my flat. And then I get a very, very good flat field by doing that. Um, that's the only way I can calibrate this perfectly. I use darks, but only a three or four darks. There's really not a lot of um you know heat uh, the, the foreign called pixels to even bother so biases are actually a no-go for this it's just it, it does more damage than it does good so this is that and then i've been working on the pelican nebula with the same telescope same camera same everything now this is it there's not a lot of data i believe it's about 15 hours and you know to my liking it's not enough i have to do at least one more night of ha but you know saying that the detail inside the pelican itself, and again, this isn't over-processed, just some noise reduction, star reduction, and that's it. But I, I was looking at this image and I wanted to make a quick comparison to last year's image I did of the pelican nebula. And you know, you can see the progression. This is my last year's image. This is with the CCD. This is with the GSO. And you can see that this is blown up as well and badly processed because, you know, I didn't know how to process them. But you can see, like, the detail isn't even as close to the other telescope. So I, I have to say that, you know, it's almost like a, a new, a discovering a new hobby when you have a uh, uh, device is good. And again, this is my first shot they have the Network Nebula. It's It was okay. I mean, it was okay for the time, but just the differences in, in processing things. Yeah. Um, two two more images I did. So I got my wide field telescope, which is a Takahashi FSQ 106M. It was, it was actually weird enough, you had tilt in there, which is rare. I don't know where the tilt was coming from. So I had to spend um, an hour with a tilt plate uh, that I got from TSO to kind of remove that tilt plate. But when I did, it's actually a very impressive telescope. I was thinking to replace it with the Riccardi Wonders made by Officina Stellari, but I found out that the star size on the FSQ is much smaller mm. and the uh, imaging field is much bigger than that. So I decided yeah. to keep it, but yeah. this is 500 millimeters and you can actually see details in the lot 15, which I'm really surprised with. And again, this is maybe eight hours of data with a CCD, probably the equivalent of three hours of the CMOS. Um, so it, it's very early on, but the actual, um, I'm really liking the way the kind of image is looking. And um, hopefully in the next few months, I will get another IMX 455 to play with this telescope because I think it's a great match. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last uh, image is this, the elephant trunk nebula. That's lovely. Uh, Ivan, uh, just a quick question from the chat from Beatrice. Um, I know the answer, but I give it to you. What mount do you use to carry the Officina Stellare? Yeah, I actually, I was um, I was using a Mead LX850 last year, and that's not really something that you want to use with professional telescopes. So I was lucky enough to find the Paramount, uh, software based Paramount ME1. It is an older mount. It still has a serial port with 12 plugs. Some people never seen that. It's like a, seeing a phone book in an a actual um, public uh, phone. Uh, so. It is older, it is maybe 10 years old or 12 years old or older, but it can carry uh, up to 150 pounds flat and it does a, an amazing job. It is something that's big, heavy, and it's it's not, you cannot move it around. It's stuck to a permanent period in my back garden. Yeah, okay. Um, for the small images, for the FSQ, I actually use a Iopchon um, CM40EC. I think it's a really nice little scope mount. Um, it's just got a weird balancing situation. I think everybody who's played with those knows that balance is very finicky. 
this is again this is only maybe two or three hours with the elephant trunk and uh, there's some weird distortions happening here i don't know why <laughs> maybe it's the, the the light cone or something but um yeah i'm hoping the weather in california stays how it is luckily my part is actually pretty good um the fires are far further away from me so my my seeing is is 10 times better than what it was last year when we had okay. to stay in inside the, turn the lights on during the day so um yeah that's it that's it from me i'm really really excited about the uh, of china Stellari telescope but one again thank you uh to ts optics thanks torsten and michael i know i bothered you guys a lot uh through the days when i was trying to get it uh and again thank you to my friend who, who actually made it work i could not i'll be honest if it was up to me that telescope uh would not be fixed so yeah, oh. yeah. Thank you very much. That's really yeah. promising. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's for sure. Well, so, just to just to add a little bit of detail, that telescope costs around twenty thousand dollars brand new. Wow. So if it wouldn't be good, then the people at Officina Stellari wouldn't have a business right now. But they're, yeah, they're actually not. pretty good <laughs> and sell to universities. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Then uh, I will give the word back to Julian for for some of his most recent images. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just share my screen again. Uh, we basically ended at the, at the perfectly right time because the last image uh, I showed was the last image before I got the Rasa. And um, let me think, what was my first image with the Rasa? I think it was this one, yeah. That was just an Orion image where I merged the the data from the 15 inch one uh, with the wide field from the Rasa. And you can see the, the diffraction spikes, um, but that got me hooked because it was very short data. Um, and then my first, the next one was um, M63, which was that one. Can you guys see that? Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Oh. That was, um, I saw the A-pod from, from an astrophotographer I really admire. I don't know if you guys know him. He's called Fabian Nair. Um, I think he's, I think he's from Switzerland, but um, he took an amazing image of this, and I just wanted to see. Like, I knew, okay, I finally got this this amazing setup with the Rasa and the the monochrome camera, and I just wanted to see if if I could get the same. And um, it's not quite up to his, but I was really blown away at, at the halo around the galaxy, and all of the smaller galaxies. And also the detail, really. Um, that was that definitely got me hooked on imaging faint stuff. And I what think the next one. Using, what filters are you using with uh, for, the, for that image? I'm using, or I have been using the TS Optics LRGB filters. Um, they're fine, um, but I think at f two you really need specialized filters. Um, so I don't have, I basically sold my entire gear at this point, but, um, and I'm not sure yet what I'll be buying when I get my next setup, but, um, I don't know, something a bit more expensive, probably. <laughs> That's one of the downsides of imaging at F2 is just that everything that isn't really good or perfect or whatever, um, it just, it's going to show up in the final image. You can see it in the form of halos in this one, which was my uh, second image, which was also my deepest integration ever with 80 hours. Um, but yeah. I got I to gotta was... wait to remove those halos if you want. Uh, it's... Uh, I, I know there are ways in, in PixInsight, but... Um, well, let's know. just say I can send you a zip and you can just load the processes and then it's more <laughs> like standardized, but... So and um, what happens with these filters is if you use regular filters with a high speed telescope, something called band shift happens when the filters yep. cannot render the speed of your telescope. So basically there's some problems with the data you get. So you really need to match the filters to your F ratio or you'll see yeah, different definitely. things. Definitely. The issue is that filters are really expensive. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I still, had great images with these really cheap filters. I only paid a hundred euros for them used, which is amazing for a full set of LRGB filters. But um, 
yeah i mean it is what it is but that image really blew my mind in terms of depth that was just definitely one of my favorites yeah. um yeah and then i also a bit later i got the new um the new f2 filters from Bader. And that's what I use for my three latest shots. I think wait, I also have it in big right here. So when you say new, is this the new CMOS optimized? Or just yeah, exactly. Regular? That's that's the new um, F2 CMOS optimized. Uh, I think the H alpha is 3.5 nanometers and the O3 is 4.5. So even with with a system like the ROS, I think I used five minute subs. And even then, like the you can see the styles are so small. I did do some star reduction, but still, they're really small, and the detail is just like fantastic. That was, I think, thirty minutes of integration time. That image, and there's basically no noise. Yeah, I have a question about the O3 filter, the new O3 filter. Mm -hmm. um, I found with the the you know the older O3 um, Vada filter, the high speed one, um, that you got a a terrible reflection of the corrector plate mm -hmm. appearing on, on brighter star on, on, on very bright stars i never I used the, the old ones so i can't really comment on that but um the the new ones are really clean are they um, maybe right. the new coding that they're uh, that battery saying peter dealt with the reflections it could be d -d 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 i no i did do some testing but I don't think I can. I don't think I'll find the images right now. But I can I can send them to you later if you're interested. Um, essentially, the even at, at on really bright stars like I did. I think I did my testing on Deneb, which is, I think it's a decently bright star, and the halo only started showing up after 30 to 60 seconds of exposure time, and it was really dim. Um, and I think for for the price that they're um wanting for this filter, I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, if, if you want perfect images, you're going to have to go with chroma filters. But we all know well, the cost of those. Not even chroma. So I got reflections of my old RC of, uh, oh, really? in the veil. I got big reflections. So it's, yeah. it's, it's more complicated than that. Usually reflections will happen, but most filters minimize them. So yeah. yeah. I mean, I can just say that I'm really happy with them. And my latest one was this one, the Eastern Veil. Um, that one was really cool because I never, I you don't see this outer, how do I call that? Shell, shell or, or yeah. yeah, it looks like a veil, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it okay. doesn't show up that often. Okay. Yeah, and that was pretty cool. And that was basically the last image I took. And uh, I've since sold my telescope, sold my mount. I still have the camera. I'm probably going to sell that too. And uh, yeah, now I'm taking a short break. And next year I'll be back with a new setup. How much exposure did you, did you have in the Eastern Veil there, in the network nebula, the back nebula? How much I think you? it was eight hours. And what was the split between HA and, and oxygen? And, uh, oxygen I don't know. Um, maybe it's right here. The XA for my colors. Nope. I can try checking Astro, but it's it's been a while since I since I imaged that. Well, I'm just curious to compare, right? To compare the f five point four to f two. That's all. Um, yeah, let me see. It, it should show up on Astro bin. Yeah, I was too lazy. I think it was <laughs> five hours of H alpha and three hours of O three. Beautiful. I think it's it's a, like a, I'm not gonna say this. In a, it's a very beautiful shot, and I think you rarely see that wisp wispy outside. Yeah. Yeah, I was a I was a huge fan of that image. Uh, and yeah, then can you also show us the M one hundred one? Any shot? I can, but honestly, I don't like the image. <laughs> Where is it? In my That's, opinion, it's great. I think it's that one. I, I also have a bunch of different versions. On, on IG. So the first one was... I think it little them. There's one here. Yeah, um, this one's great. 
Yeah, that, it, it had a lot of resolution when you consider that this was shot at 400 millimeters of focal length. But the processing, um, I'm not super happy with it. I also have a high-res version on Astrobin where there's a lot of H-alpha. Is my mouse stuck again? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's. I think that's uh, mind blowing. The 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 amount of level uh, of of detail at four hundred millimeters of focal length. So that that really shows how how, how well um, good sampling and deconvolution and sharpening work. But um, I'm still not happy with the image. I don't know. It's a, it's a very beautiful image. I think as you get more data, it's going to show up. The, the faint nebulosity at the bottom, or the faint, sorry, um, well, islands of the galaxy start to show up, which is rare to see, right? But the bottom, you can see like a little ghosting of it. Yeah. And, I mean, this yeah. is 20 hours of integration at F2, but uh, it wasn't enough to really nicely show the, the outer um, parts of the galaxy. I tried. <laughs> I really did, but it did not look nice. I think you can see a bit more in this one, but sadly, German internet is awful. <laughs> no, it doesn't want to show up. <laughs> oh, oh, you, yeah, can still, you can still, yeah, you can see it, yeah. Yeah, yeah I can see it. That's a bit more, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's a very tough target. One of the toughest that I've tried until now, maybe next year with a new setup. <laughs> um, but yeah. I'm not sure that that was my old setup right here. So that was um, a an EQ6 from 2005, and I tuned it myself and um, switched the, the gears, not the gears, the the bearings, and re it and and fine tuned it, and it really worked nicely, considering how old it was. And then the Rasa and my QHW 183M, that was was a very fun setup to use. Yep, that's basically my journey up until now. <laughs> cool, really cool to see. And I hope when you're back, back in the business again, that we can see even more photos. Then, but really cool to to see your progression over the time. And uh, yeah, there were great results. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I am eyeing the Rasa Eleven for my next telescope. Uh, it's okay. Uh, Get the V2 if you do, Julian. Yeah, the yeah. The V1 yeah. Is, is a piece of crap. Yeah, I, I've heard a lot of... I mean, I've heard some from some people that they had good experiences with it, but the focuser, I think I wouldn't want it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right. Or you can get an RC and get into the same class with me and uh, the person. <laughs> I think I can't get away from F2. It's just, oh. it's addictive. <laughs> It's really well, addictive. Try, uh, you, you like the Newtonian. Look at the resolution that a long focal length will give you versus the speed. And I think there's some people who like the speed and some people who like the resolution. Um, that's all I can say, honestly. I like both, but um, when I have to choose, I'll prefer speed, I think. <laughs> well, you can go get an astrophysics, Ricardo Condors. It's only 25,000 years. Yeah, I mean, if, if you it. pay for and it, I'll take it. <laughs> Ju yeah. Julian, another question to the observatory where you are working with. Um, you uh, you showed pictures with insane integration times. So, are you, uh, yeah, uh, are you a member of the of the observatory staff, or or how are you able to to use it that frequently? Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm I'm a member of the. It's called Sternenfreunde Breisgau. In case ah, you know okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, it's basically just a, a, a Southern Germany astronomy club from, from my city. Mm. And um, yeah, you can basically use the, the observatory whenever it's free and mm. no one else wants to use it. I mean, if someone does, they'll just have to, I don't know. What, what mount did they use for the big Newtonian? Um, it is, I, I can't tell you the name. It's a very old mount. It's, I think it's 15 to 20 years old. It's a fork mount, a really heavy one, oh, like yeah. three, 400 kilos. And connection. Julian just mentioned it. German internet. Yep. Uh, <laughs> sorry for that. I hope now it stays a bit more stable. 
It's fine. It's fine. You just block. Yeah. Guys, I have to drop off at, at this time. I'm sorry I can't sure. save it later, but uh, it, it's been always a pleasure uh, to, to chat with you guys. Nice to meet you, Julian, and amazing images. And I'm excited yeah, to see what we do next. Um, F thank you for your time, Owen. Great that you uh, joined us here. See you next time. Yes, yeah. awesome. I need to, yeah. I need to head off as well. Um, okay. Great being with you again this evening. Uh, nice to meet you, Julian. Great images. Um, oh, just a quick question. In terms of, if you do get the Rasa 11, what, what mount are you going to look at regarding your next setup? Um, I'm still deciding. I'm very interested in the, I don't know if you know it, it's a, it's a European mount from Gemini. It's called the e -frick. It's a very new mount. I think it came out last year or the year before. Uh, essentially, it's a friction-driven mount that carries up to 30 kilos of payload. Um, and I really like the, the concept behind it. It's a direct drive, right? Yep. Nice. Yeah, very, very accurate, cool. Um, cool. but also very expensive. <laughs> cool, guys. Okay. Till next time. Right. See ya. See ya. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Soon. Yeah. So, Bye. there was, there's still one thing to do, and I'm really, really happy about the opportunity. Um, I'm really happy that some of you uh, guys out there sent us photos and I want to take this chance to show them. Um, unfortunately, only, uh, yeah, let's say a quickly, a quick show of the photos. If you want to see more of them, more details, just keep sending them to the email address that you see uh, on, the, on the lower screen here. Just keep sending those images to this email address to uh, write something to it, uh, some information, and then I can show them here. Uh, the first one from one of our resident viewers, Beatrice Heinze, sent me two pictures. Um, and I just want to show them to you. And I can also read some of the data if you provide me some uh, more information, then I can also uh, share this information. Uh, this is taken with a ZWO ASI 533MC on an iOptron CEM60 mount. Uh, I believe without guiding, I think, I'm not sure if I interpret it correctly, ZWO uh, UV cut filters and this is taken from Belgium. So super cool. Super cool to see this. And there's another one. Winter time here. This is the Rosette Nebula. Also taken with the same equipment. And both of these images are exposed something around 9.3 hours. So really, really deep already. That's for this one. So you can see how nice and clean the data is. There's not a lot of noise. Yeah, it would be interesting, Beatrice, if you uh, uh, just uh, still watching how many subframes these were. Yes, without guiding. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so this is really clean. Nice to see this. Okay, and another one. I believe uh, Caitlin reached out to mm -hmm. us in the first session, Caitlin Moore, and. <laughs> sure, no problem. You're welcome. Um, she sent me two pictures, one of the uh, of the total solar eclipse taken from Chile. Uh, this is with a Fuji X-T1. Unfortunately, I don't have any more data. Uh, she wrote, the pictures are not good um, as the ones shown, but no, a total solar eclipse is always, always good. And this image yeah, is that's special. Great. Yeah, that's super cool. And also this one. Uh, yeah, that's great. Just fantastic image. Maybe we can also zoom in a bit. You know, wide field Milky Way. Oh yeah, she she's online. <laughs> Welcome, Kathleen. Cool. I so you can see so many small nebulae in these wide field shots. 
that's just great. Yeah, yeah, it's so cool to to capture these these amount of of stars and nebulosity without that much effort that we normally uh, spend into it. Shot on a star adventure. Yeah, okay, that's cool. And then uh, last but not least, I have also uh, photos from Jan. Beckman uh, that I just copied from his uh, website to be honest, but uh, there's uh, uh, As you may see there's an observatory uh, involved in, <laughs> in this image. Uh, I don't have the the details of the image But it was a very large telescope from the from the Heidelberg observatory in Germany And mm. yeah, there's not so much to say. It's just a fantastic Fantastic image, and I can you zoom in a bit? Uh, yeah, I can try. Uh, so I just loaded it from from the website. I hope you're fine with that, Jan. If you can see it, um, something I believe that's in the seventy centimeter class. So something really large, and no details, unfortunately. But fantastic, and. The second one, I like this as I personally like this even more because I tried this nebula before. I tried it with, I believe, two hours of integration time, but this is here mm -hmm. far, far more. <laughs> yeah, that is such a tough target because of all yeah. the stars in the field. Yes, yes. It looks cool. Like there's like people waving at you. Yep. <laughs> it's like two small ghosts. Yeah. Exactly. And look at the stars here. That's great. So that's um, with the that's with the six inch f two point eight, right? No, uh, it's the other one. The the image that was taken was the sharp star. Um, the, this one yeah. thirty. No, 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 I no, think. no. Uh, wasn't it? I'm not sure, but I don't believe it. Uh, well, uh, maybe you can have a look. Yeah, I'll but, um, um, I can also provide all the information in the next session, of course. Oh, it was I think the, he used a 10 inch Newtonian. I just looked it up. Yep. Oh, okay. Ten inch Super fast. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's possible. So next time I will uh, try to, to capture more, uh, uh, catch more of the information. And there were also some, some other people that reached out to us, but unfortunately I can't show for example, all the Insta accounts, uh, that's, uh, that's a bit too much. So if you have uh, photos to, to show us, just keep sending them to the email. Okay, so far, that's it. I think we had a super nice round, very informative, very interesting uh, with Julian here. And I'm really looking forward to the next one. And I hope I can uh, we've, yeah, we definitely want will have another guest uh, in the next session, and uh, we will share the the date on all our social media as usual, Insta and, and Facebook and so on, that you can again join us. Oh, just yeah. one one second, <laughs> Beatrice just uh, added informations on the on the Rosette Nebula that I just showed you, eighty five lights, with two different exposure times. And 600 seconds and 300 seconds. Wow, great. That's that's effort. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> nice to see. Yeah. Exactly. I also think we saw many, many very cool photos today. OK, so now uh, there's only one thing to do. I wish you a very nice evening and have a good time. I hope you can see you next in the next sessions again so likewise thank you, thank you so much for having me <laughs> i'll definitely sure. be watching the next one yeah sure that would be works. cool thank you all guys until next time yeah bye bye yeah bye see ya